Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bromology. My name is Dan. I'm here with one of my best friends and brothers, Michael, and this is the study of biblical food. The Book of Jude has caught the attention by truth seekers due to some of the content contained therein, such as quoting extra biblical sources like Enoch. Some simply skip over the tiny one chapter letter, others dismiss it, believing it's nothing that's applicable contained for the church today. And some just flat out refuse to read it because of the extra biblical sourcing. So if you've never sat under the teaching or gone through Jude, or you don't feel like you've had questions answered, our hope is that this two-part episode going through the words in this letter is manja to your soul as we seek to find the broma written to bring glory to the Most High in the name of Jesus Christ. And by the title alone, it's not immediately clear which Jude or Judas wrote it. Judas was a very common name in the first century, and we know this because there are at least five different Judas mentioned in the text and all of them are in the New Testament. Judas Iscariot, uh, of course, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but there's another Judas in Mark chapter 6, Acts 15, 22, Luke 6, 6, 16, and Acts 5, 37. Now, I know, or we know, we can automatically exclude Iscariot because he killed himself around the time of the crucifixion. In this book, at least it's thought to have been written in the early 60s AD. And we know that because Second Peter borrows from the book of Jude. And you can find that Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Now, there's an argument that Jude actually borrowed from Second Peter or that both of them borrowed from an external source. Uh, but for the sake of this conversation, I tend to agree with the first theory. So I'll build that into the theological framework. Michael, how you doing, brother? Doing great, Dan. That was an awesome intro. Um, we did not share notes, and it's great to just see his his point of view and my point of view. So as far as Jude's concerned, um, I'm going to talk about the second Peter as well. Um, I was doing research on when this book was written, and I just my personal opinion, I, I tend to favor it before 70 AD. You know, there's a varying range in that aspect, but um, that's, that's kind of my take on it. That's my framework, and we can get into that eventually. But um, some some things I have on Jude, it's the fourth shortest New Testament book. I thought that was interesting. Philemon, 2 John, 3 John are shorter. And Jude does not quote directly from the Old Testament, but there are at least nine obvious allusions to it. So it'll talk about the Exodus, Satan's rebellion, Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses' death, Cain, Balaam, Korah, Enoch, and Adam. And as Dan mentioned, 2 Peter and Jude have so much in common. And I like where he was going with it, which one came first. Um, I saw a stat that said they had 80 words in common and seven words of substituted synonyms between the two books. Um, and I just wanted to real quickly just show some of the similarities. Um, Second Peter and Jude, they both said, deny the master. Um, they, they both talked about angels, um, pits of darkness waiting for reserve for judgment of the great day. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, they both talked about that. They were both listed in as an example of the, that judgment. Um, they both despise authorities. Um, let's see what else. They both follow the way of Balaam. I'm sure we can get into that. Um, let's see what else. And ungodly lust. And in the last days, they'll be mockers. So again, I'm sure we're going to hit on this with our notes, Second Peter and Jude, but I thought I'd offer that. Um, real quick, some uh, church fathers. So Origen um, recognized that this letter was disputed, but he called it Holy Scripture. In the commentary on the Romans, Jerome affirmed the inspiration of Jude, but he stated that the letter was disputed because it cited First Enoch. I love how Dan mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, Tertullian claimed that First Enoch was inspired scripture, and he cited Jude, Jude as evidence of that. So just an example. You said Tertullian? Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Same guy that coined the term Trinity, just to be clear. Oh, interesting. Okay. So he mm -hmm. so he claimed First Enoch was inspired scripture and cited Jude as evidence of that. So mm -hmm. finishing off my intro as... You know, as we start to get in these books and topical discussions, you know, just a preface, you know, we just want to preface that if I say something, Dan does not necessarily agree with it and vice versa. We hold different views, but we just want to show the fruits of the spirit and love. And mm -hmm. knowing Dan for 25 years, we have a lot of things in common and it'll, <laughs> it'll be sparingly that we differ. But, uh, you know, we do, if you listen to the intro, we have two different background styles, 
but not, not necessarily the same views. Um, and before we get going, I just want to encourage everyone, please like, share, and subscribe. We'd love to have you follow along with us. Um, and finally, I just want to encourage the listener to open up their Bible and read along with us as we tackle the epistle of Jude. And if Dan doesn't have anything else, I can start us off on verse one. Please do, man. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So I'm reading Jude, this is just verse one. We're going to do line by line on this first episode. So Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Um, off to Dan for his commentary. Yeah, man. So this is, first of all, thank you. Um, it's amazing to see how God works. Because like you said, we didn't talk about this. We talk regularly, but we haven't gone through the details of this. And to see God's kind of pointing us in very similar places. So that's encouraging. Um, <clears throat> in verse one, man, there's so much there, uh, but there's just a few things that stuck out to me that I found to be broma to my soul. So verse one uh, says that Judas is the brother of James and that uh, both Matthew 13, 55 and Mark chapter six, verse three states that Jesus did in fact have a half brother named James. And so most scholars believe that this Judas is in fact the half brother of Jesus. Um, and <clears throat> the reason I think that that matters is, is twofold. The first one is that the Christian doesn't have to rely on blind faith. You don't just have to believe it just to believe it, that there's actually a method to the madness and that the biggest struggle you're going to have um, combating that. I think R.C. Sproul said it best when he said, you don't have to give up your intelligence to trust the Bible. You have to give up your pride. And I know that's been true for me Amen. many times. Um, and then the second thing uh, is that Jude, uh, Jude, excuse me, says that he's a servant of his half brother, Jesus. Um, some translations say slave. Uh, I won't get all the way into that, but here we are with a brother saying he's a slave or a servant to another brother. Now I don't, have any brothers, but I do have sisters. And I don't know what it would take for me to believe that my sibling was God, much less call myself a slave. So it does, it, it begs the question, who is this, who is this guy, Jesus, that his brother would say that to him? Um, the other thing I saw was the word called kind of defining what, what that looks like. I think, uh, Romans eight, Paul says this, he says, uh, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he knew foreknown, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brethren. That's a context in which Paul talks about what this means to be called. There's a few other verses too. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, also 2 Timothy. You kind of you kind of see some of the same, same called. Um, and then the word beloved, I like that one, um, because how do we know that a God loves us? Um, uh, that's a huge truth. We, we can't miss in our theological framework. God loves you. He loves you how you are. He loves you, he created you on purpose. He loves you. Well, how do we know this? Well, for me, this is, I think it applies in some senses to everybody, but specifically in the context of what it means to be a quote unquote Christian. Um, he says we're kept for Jesus Christ. So I, I looked at that word kept and it says it's, it's the same word that Luke uses in Acts 12, five, when he's talking about Peter being kept in prison. And so it's this idea that there's this like external authority ruling over where we're kept. I think it's, that's associated with the, with the covenant. Um, yeah, man, that's some of the stuff that came, came to light, came to, I don't know what God impressed on my mind and wanted me to pray through, um, for Jude one. That's a lot awesome. of information for Jude one, one verse. It's crazy, no, it's man. Great. I'm sure you've got more stuff too. It just makes it even crazier. I do. We, we, <laughs> we, we talked a little bit before and I'm heavy on Jude one. Um, might as well start off with a bang, right? Baseball analogy. We're, we're leadoff hitters right now. Um, so I enjoyed what you were saying. Um, and it's amazing that you you were tiptoeing around all these verses, but we didn't talk about the same verse. So right. <laughs> that's amazing. We didn't compare notes, like I said. So, you know, nobody's stealing anybody's thunder here. That's so right. um, Jude, a bondservant of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So bear with me, guys. I've, I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture and cross-referencing just on this one verse. Um, and then I have a, a, a study to end it. 
Um, but bond servant or slave, you know, Dan mentioned both, and I agree. Um, he went a different route. I'm going to go with Romans 6, 20. It says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death, you know. Uh, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, I just want to point out, everybody's a slave to something. Uh, maybe that's not obvious to some, but we are. You're either slave to your sin or you're slave to Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And I think J Jude says he's a slave or bond servant of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We can get into that another time. I think Romans 6 does a great job. Slave of sin, slave of Christ. You're no longer doing your, your best to sin. You know, you're freed from that and you, you, you want to get sanctified and obey, obey Christ. And just happen to be his brother, <laughs> his half brother, like Dan was saying. So that, that's my first thing on this, the bond servant. Um, who are called? You know, he, he went over who are called. I don't have anything on beloved. I have called. So what, where I went with this is Matthew 22. So who are called? So this is the parable of the wedding. So 22, one Yeshua spoke to them in parable saying the kingdom of heaven. That's the gospel guys. Jesus, when he says the gospel, it's the gospel of the kingdom. So here's a parable of how he's describing that. So the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for a son. Who is it? Who could that be? Wedding supper of the lamb, anybody? So he sent out his slaves, his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. So again, two things here, slaves, the slave of the king, that's Jude, mm -hmm. you know, Jude, to call those who have been invited. That's a separate category. So they're already part of the wedding. Mm -hmm. they, they're already with Yeshua, with Jesus. He's calling them to, to call those who had been invited. So other people. So that's the gospel that we're supposed to preach to the others. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, who are unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat and livestock. All are butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Um, but they paid no attention and they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. To me, that's, we talked about in the intro, Babylon, <laughs> those shiny lights. They didn't care about coming to the wedding feast. They're, you know, they're working. They're on their farm. We talked about that too. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. We'll talk about Sodom probably next episode. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways and as many of you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves, again, those are who are part of the wedding, went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Guys, we need to make sure we're dressed properly. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? Man was speechless. The king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot and throw him in the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Dan knows I have a study on the chosen. We can maybe get to that in future episodes, but I'm mainly talking about many are called. Few are chosen. You need your proper wedding clothes. Um, and the slaves are the ones calling. It's our job to call the rest to the kingdom. Um, so some some verses about what these wedding clothes will be. Isaiah 61.10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with garland, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Revelation 3, one of my favorite, Philadelphia. I believe this is Philadelphia. Um, actually, no, this is a different church. So remember what you have received and heard and, ke and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you will have few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes thus will be clothed in white garments. Um, and then finally, Revelation 19, seven through nine, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteousness acts of the saints. Amen. So again, I think it ties in with this whole wedding supper of the lamb. The slave Jude was a slave to Christ. It was his job to call 
other, you know, he's pre- preached the gospel to get him into this kingdom, making sure you have the proper government. Finally, on verse one, I just have something real quick. So Dan mentioned he focused on the word called, loved, and kept. Obviously, that's a huge part of this verse one. I found a study in Isaiah known as the servant songs, where Israel, his people, and in my opinion, who what we're grafted into is described in the same manner. So the servant songs, also known as the servant poems or the songs of the suffering servant, are four songs in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, Isaiah 49, 1 through 6, Isaiah 54 through 11, and Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. So the songs are four poems written about a certain servant or slave of Yahweh. Yahweh calls a servant to lead the nations, but the servant is horribly abused by them. In the end, he is rewarded. Does this sound familiar? Yeshua, Jesus went, did the same. We're, we're supposed to do the same. We are supposed, the world is not supposed to like us by preaching the truth. And what, is there something we can expect as servants of Yeshua? That's what I have for verse one. Anything there, Dan, or would you like me to read verse two? I mean, there's, there's so much <laughs> there, man. It's so good though. I love to see how, how it kind of all works together, different perspectives. And I love what you said about the gospel, gospel of the kingdom. I think that's a very important thing to understand that God, that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Um, that in, I believe that that gospel includes the gospel of the cross, but sure. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think there's uh, there's a lot there. So now, dude, that's Amen. awesome, man. Thank you. Amen. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going to read verse two. I have no notes. Hopefully, I can uh, we can go back and forth with Dan. But I just want to read: May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Off to you, brother. Bro, so the first thing that stuck out here um, is that this is a prayer. So Jude's actually praying over the called. Um, and <clears throat> he uses words, of course. That's how God talks to us is, is through scripture. Um, but sometimes these blessings would be said out loud. In this case, obviously, it's a letter. Um, so what we see here is, I know you, in the beginning, in your intro, you said that he doesn't directly quote from the Old Testament, right? Is that what you, you pointed out? Like but he, he, does, he didn't, yeah, it wasn't he didn't directly exact, correct, right. it, he but he does them. allude to it. Yeah. Correct. Referenced it. Exactly. So I think this is one of those examples, the prayer. Um, so I found it in numbers chapter six, verses 22 through 27. And it says, this is how you are to bless them. The Israelites say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Wow, that's um, one of my favorite Old Testament verses. That's the ironic blessing. I mean, that's beautiful. Awesome. awesome. So I do think that's what Jude's doing here, um, this type of thing. Um, and then there's another example in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21, that we don't have time to unpack all that. But if you want to look at it on your own time, that's another example. Um, and then, I, I mean, what he prayed for them. Um, so I had three. The first one is mercy. Uh, and this one's one that I'm, I, if somebody has been praying for me somewhere out there that I would come to understand mercy better, thank you for that because I have, uh, recently it's crazy, man. So I've got two kids, um, a beautiful 15 year old daughter. She's honestly just good hearted. Like she just has a good heart. People ask us what you guys are doing because she's so good. She makes us look like good parents. You know I what can, I mean? I like, can vouch for that. <laughs> she's just a good kid, man. Sends us Bible verses every morning, her mother and I, to encourage us. I mean, just I could go on and on. Um, and then we have a, a three-year-old boy named Vaughn, well, almost three-year-old boy named Vaughn. And I've always wanted, I wanted a brother growing up. And then when I became, you know, a parent for the first time, I wanted a son. My daughter caught me off by surprise and she continues to. That's, I knew when I found out she was a girl that that's what was going to happen. But when I did finally get my son, man, I just, everyone that knows me knows I just love the kid. And I think coming from an Italian background, we have a tendency to favor the, the firstborn born boys. And just boys in general kind of get favored in Italian families. But um, I found myself doing that a lot, not intentionally, but just favoring him. Um, so one morning, I've never really raised my voice with him. I've never spanked him. Like, he, you know, he's I'm just super patient with him. You know, he's two. So anyways, uh, I was getting them ready in the morning and 
um, he was just having a bad morning complaining about everything. He didn't want to get a, put a diaper on. You're like, you're shocked that I'm putting a diaper on you. We do this every single day. Like he just wanted to have a morning where he was going to fight about everything. And I'm trying to get his lunch ready, get the, uh, get my daughter out the door too. And so anyways, he's yelling and I just scream at him, man, like, shut up. Like just, you know, totally out of anger and frustration and just hit a, hit a tipping point. And it scared him. Um, like shocked him, you know, like he literally physically shook. Um, and I was like, dang, man, like I just, that was hurtful for me because I know I hurt him. And like, I had a reason to be frustrated, you know what I mean? But I started thinking like, what does the Bible teach about being angry? And so I started digging around and I think it's in Ephesians four. Um, and Paul talks about don't sin in your anger. And I was like, but the problem is, I don't think I've ever actually been angry and not sinned. Like, I don't think I've ever lost my mind like I did in that example, being, you know, getting angry and like put God first. And I know there's a, sorry to interrupt. I know there's a verse that says, don't go to sleep angry too. So we're expected to get angry, but don't go to sleep. Correct. Yes. Love that. Yes, man. So we get him off to school. I get back home and man, I'm just devastated in my heart. Like, Oh my gosh, all I want him to do is forgive me. You know, like, cause at the end of the day, I didn't yell at him because that was good discipleship. I yelled at him because I was frustrated and I was a lazy parent and I didn't know how to process my emotions properly. And I sinned against him. I sinned in my anger. And all I wanted from him was mercy. I remember praying to God, please just like bring him home to me. You know, like some, the reality is, man, in the world we live in, sometimes your kids don't come home, you know, and like, that's a, it's a humbling thing to think about. And I started praying, God, just please bring my son home to me. Cause I just want to tell him I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Um, so anyways, I, w- I desired mercy. That's really what I wanted from him. And if you look at the end of Ephesians four, it talks about forgiveness, like the antidote to um, anger is understanding that you're no longer under judgment because of mercy. So when I pick my son up, he didn't condemn me and judge me. He met me with mercy and grace. And I know that even though he's little, cause I said, Hey buddy, listen, man, daddy's really, really sorry. Like I was not nice to you this morning. You didn't deserve that. I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? And he goes, yeah, daddy, I forgive you. You bring golf cart. So he was over it within like a second, you know, like there was no judgment in his heart. So and man, mercy just, is a blessing. And Mercy's throughout the whole Bible, man. And it's amazing with what God does, you know, for his children. Even Adam, there was mercy. You know, mm-hmm. he got kicked out of the garden. He still lived almost a thousand years. Um, uh, but uh, I hope you don't mind me sharing this because this is off the cuff here because I have nothing on too. But baby Vaughn is a kind of like a miracle baby. And mm-hmm. uh, Dan and I both share um, in this that, uh, you know, in, in the intro, I was talking about Rob's keep on virtual house church and kind of, they were going through the tour portions. And I remember sharing, sharing with Dan one of these times, because mm-hmm. if you notice, he said his daughter was 15 and his baby Vaughn is three. That's a 12 year gap. And I'm sure they were trying to have kids between that time. And so uh, a miracle that, that father gave Dan was um, I was going through one of the tour portions one week and I forgot the old Testament chapter, but, uh, the, the prophet section was Samson. Um, his mother wanted a child and she couldn't have one and she stopped drinking wine. And then in the new Testament, it was baby John and his mom wanted a child and stopped drinking wine. And then they had a promised son after they did that. And I know I shared that with, with Dan one time and, uh, he, it really hit him. And then he had his wife stop drinking wine. And then I think within a month he had baby baby Vaughn and was blessed mm-hmm. with a baby boy. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. The, the, that started in, um, obedience to the Sabbath that's connected to that. Um, because of the house church stuff and the stuff you had been studying the stuff God had been doing in your life, in your life, you were sharing the good news. You were seeing fruit from it and you were like, Hey man, this is great. You know, like, and so, it was actually on a Sabbath practicing, intentionally practicing Sabbath. My wife and I both were doing it and we were watching the chosen. I think it was. And one of the episodes, um, they, they point out the Samson 
you know, actually it might've been the Bible. I'm sorry. It might've, it was the Bible, not chosen. And it's just the story of Samson. And there's this vow that's taken and it was associated with wanting to have a son. Um, but you got to give up not only alcohol, but fermented drinks. And at that time I was actually going, drinking those like kombucha, you know what I mean? Like the gut healing, yeah. because I got all these gut, gut, gut issues. So I'm drinking this kombucha. That's fermented drink. So I felt God speak it to me too. It wasn't only Kristen Amen. with uh, alcohol, but it, and alcohol for me too. But also that fermented drink. And that's the thing with obedience. Sometimes you don't always like. I could have been like, well, that's not technically a law to have. You know what I mean? But it's like, well, no, man. Like God, God told me to set it down, and, whether I understand it or not. You know. And on on its face, it was like, okay, I got to get my wife to stop drinking alcohol. But then you you right. were convicted to be like, oh man, I'm doing fermented it's, drinks with kombucha. That's right. And, I'm, and, yeah. And I just want to say it's Nazarite vow. That's the vow he's talking about. That's but it. Continue, that's exactly continue. right. That's exactly right. Um, and so, anyways, yeah. So. What was interesting about that is God was also working in my wife at the same time. The seer, the spirit spoke to her while she we were watching the show together. And she looked at me and she goes, I think that was for me. The message from she's watching the show about taking that vow. And then she says, I thought that I think that's for me. And it was placed on my heart too. So so we were obedient to it. And God did bless us with a beautiful baby boy. And so that is a true testimony uh, to his glory. That's awesome. Um, yep. so I don't have anything else on two. You want me to read three and hand it back to you? Um, yeah, but I got one okay. more thing I want to add to it. it. So he, he prayed for uh, peace and love. We won't go through all that. Um, there was just one other thing I wanted to add to it. Cause there was this like past tense type of vibe to it. Like Jude was praying as if they, he's not only praying for it, but he's also praying like th- that they already have it. Like they're reminded that they already have it. Um, and the reason I concluded that um, is because he prays for it to be multiplied, not added. So mercy be multiplied to you, peace be multiplied, love be multiplied to you. Well, in multiplication, if you multiply any number by zero, it's just zero. So <clears throat> that means these things, these, the called had already received that mercy, <laughs> amen, deposit. that peace, that love, that deposit, yes. And he's praying for it for them over them applicable right now and for their future. So that was it, dude. It was, and, that was the multiplied thing was cool. And those are the fruits of the spirit. So it links, you know, it still links with a deposit, you know, and being multiplied. I mean, we grow, we grow in the fruits. We're not just giving Amen. it right away as soon as you hear the name. Um, Amen. So I will, I'll read three and hand it back to you. Or you want to, you want to, yeah, I'll do that. I'll read three. So three says in Jude, if you're following along, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. What you got? Cool. Um, Let's see. So what stuck out to me here is that the faith has um, definite content. It's not subject to like gut feelings or preferences or, you know, what, what you want it to be. Um, this is why, uh, for me, I do put a little bit of value in like church fathers, creeds, et cetera. Here's where I think there's room for those things is maybe a better way of saying it. Um, the point is I'm not trying to understand the text completely by myself but recognize that I'm standing on the shoulders of millions of other Christians who came before me uh, that cared about the same Bible as I do. Does that make sense? It does. And let uh, me just interject real quick that what we're doing right now is commentary. So don't freak out. Like it's okay, to, it's okay to quote other commentators. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the point that I think I'm trying to drive at is that we all kind of are in this thing together. Nobody's got it hundred percent figured out. Like, I think we need to humble ourselves that in that way. Um, and so in that, that's what I'm getting at with like, when I see creeds and dogmas, um, I see just basically a summary of what the Bible teaches regarding like key doctrines, you know? Um, so there are boundaries that separate correct orthodoxy. So you can identify this is correct. And this is heresy. I think we need to be able to do that to actually have faith. Um, so creeds are not what distinguishes Christianity. Um, 
but there are things even deeper than that, like called confessions, for example. So if you're, maybe you have a Catholic background, um, or a Presbyterian or Baptist, or I mean, really any quote unquote organized Christian religion, um, then you're going to have these things called confessions and they deal with like the details of like specific denominations. So some examples would be like Baptists believe in believers, baptism, Presbyterians will sprinkle the babies. You know what I mean? Like these are secondary issues. They're not like salvational issues. Well, per se. Okay. So <clears throat> the reason that I think this is, this is a big deal. Uh, Jude says the the faith was delivered once and for all. So the faith contains very specific doctrine. Um, and any change of that, Jude says later on in his letter, Jude says it perverts the gospel. It perverts it. So I started thinking of this and I was like, it, it's almost like, and I'm talking about the gospel now. You know, so earlier we were talking about the um gospel message or the kingdom message that is yep. the gospel. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. Um it has defined terms. So we don't get to just pick randomly what we think that is, but there's actual doctrine that define what it is. And so I started thinking about it and it was like us being Italian, right? Here we are in the manja again. I'm always thinking about food somehow, somehow, by the way, pasta, uh, yum. yeah, I, I called my buddies or I, I send them these voice messages as I try to learn how to speak Italian. You know, they're from Salerno, Italy. So I, I'll send them like examples of me trying to learn and they just laugh at me and send it back to me in Italian. Um, so anyways, I, I, hopefully I'm, I'm getting better at my Italian. I think it's still terrible, but for, if they're listening, Paolo, Giovanni, if you're listening, possevide una peroni per favore. And hopefully that translates the way it should. Um, but anyways, <laughs> it's like having a, a family secret sauce recipe. You know what I'm saying? Where like Nona, grandma, my mom might even be your mom. Um, she, they have these certain like ways that they do it. You leave the temperature at a certain time. You take the pot off at the right time. You don't burn the tomatoes. You might use this type of salt. For example, you might use this type of tomato. And if you get to like new agey, you might say like, well, I'm not going to use San Marzano's anymore. I'm going to use like a, I don't know, this new like hip, non-GMO, organic, whatever. You know, you start messing with the actual doctor, you know, fundamental ingredients, then you pervert what it was intended to be. You pervert what you originally fell in love with. You know what I'm saying? Like the first time I tried that pasta, I was like, whoa, there was joy there. And if you start messing with those ingredients, it's not, a, it's by definition, naturally not even the same thing anymore. And so that's kind of what I got. I know that's, that's a lot to get out of um, three, I'm but ready. I'm ready for common, lunch. You know, common salvation, contending. He says, contend for the faith that was delivered once and for all. So there's a faith that was delivered one time that counts for all times. And those have specific doctrines and they're important. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Time for lunch. You said. No, I said, I just said I'm hungry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> manja. Manja. Um, so I have a, a decent amount on three, very little on four. Um, and I'm going, I'm not going to focus on the salvation. That's a huge, huge topic. Um, but I am going to focus on the word common. And so I'll, I'll be honest, uh, a lot in common, if, if it's the same word, it's koine, you know, that's where we get koine Greek. Right. And that, that, that word means common. So, but, uh, it, that might not be the same word, but, uh, the word in this particular verse is could also mean impure, defiled, unwashed, and unholy. And at first, I was like, "Wow, look at all these verses talking about um, impure, defiledness, unwashed, unholy. This is our salvation." But then I found three awesome verses in the New Testament that I think do a great job on describing it. And so, beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, so Titus. Titus 1, uh, to Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace of God from God, the Father in Christ. So we have common faith. So there's a common salvation. There's a common faith. Acts 2, Acts 2 Church. We talked about that in the intro. And all those who had helped, number 44, and all those who had, who had, uh, all, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Again, Acts 2 Church, they pulled all their stuff, um, together and had all things in common. 
and sharing, you know, and, and hey, you can use this, you can use this, common, common things. So we have common faith, common salvation, common belief. It's talking about believers that all, have all these things in common. And then the final verse, Acts 4, 32, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart. Again, that's Shema too. We, we quoted ironic blessing, Shema, one heart. One soul, and not one of them claimed anything belonging to him as was his own, but all things were common property to them. Um, and with great power, the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus and the abundant grace upon them. So, I, you know, I started off with like impurity, defilement, unwashed, but there's a common salvation among believers. There's a common faith. We should be sharing things together, common property. I just think that was a great way of describing the common salvation. Um, this this whole common thing made me think of the parable of the workers. So I did the parable of the gospel of the kingdom, a parable of the wedding feast. Now I'm going to do the parable of the workers. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Matthew 20, 8 through 12 says, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received it in an area. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. And this is the common salvation, guys. This is, in my opinion, parable of the workers is talking about salvation. We can talk about treasures in heaven and all that kind of stuff, but salvation is salvation. We're all guaranteed, you know, those in the faith are guaranteed the same salvation. And I think the parable of the workers talks about that. Um, mm -hmm. Common salvation, common faith, common things. We should be sharing amongst believers. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, just on three, um, I can't let this go, the saint. So to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which once all handed down to the saints. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys noticed, but saints not in the Old Testament. So uh, we get the English word saint from the Latin word sanctus, which is translated from the Greek word hagios which means holy. The Aramaic word is kadish. I'm probably butchering that. Um, the Hebrew word is kadosh or kadesh, holy, holy people. So there's, like I said, there's no word in Hebrew for saint as we tend to understand it. The Hebrew word then gets translated saint or holy people in many English Bibles, kadasim. Um, some examples in the Old Testament, Leviticus 11, actually in the New, both actually. Le Leviticus 11, for I am Yahweh your Elohim, and you shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you should be holy, for I am holy. First Peter 1, 15 through 16, and he called you who is holy, so you be holy in all manner of life, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Deuteronomy 5, 12, we talked about it earlier. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as Yahweh the Elohim hath commanded thee. It's a holy day. Philippians 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Yahweh. We talked about being slaves of Yeshua HaMashiach. To all the saints of Messiah, Yeshua. And finally, Revelation 14, here is the perseverance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and, and have faith in Yeshua. So it all intertwines um, common salvation, being a saint. What does saint mean? It means to be holy. What does holy mean? Um, and be sanctified. So that's what I got for mm. three. Uh, anything Dude, to comment on that? So I do. I don't, I don't think you know. I don't. Well, I think this is the spirit work. It's literally catching me off guard. That what is the strong uh, concordance for that Greek word you're using hagiadzo to be made holy to be basically the saints? Do you know the strong concordance number? I do not. I can look, okay. but no. I so don't. if you well, just confirm it. I can tell you what it is. I believe it's thirty-seven, and you know me with thirty-seven. How that's my number? I literally have that tattooed on my forearm, hagiadzo, because okay. it's strong's thirty-seven, so and I. So it is 40, but obviously that's the root. So the root uh, is Hagios, but yes, what you have. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so cool. Now that's super cool. Um, so I love that. That was great. Um, and then the other well, thing- before you get going, 40, yeah, is a, yeah. 40 is an interesting number. I mean, that's a huge number. So this 40 days and 40 days temptation mm. and all that kind of stuff. So that's, sure. a, that's a saint right there. But go ahead, Mark. Absolutely, bad. that's good. Um, so just like in those first three verses, bro, like, there's so much information. I mean, we had to be like, look, we can't even get into salvation because that's a whole thing, like in just three <laughs> verses. And what's crazy is Jude set out to unpack all that stuff. That was his goal in this letter was like, I, that was my intent was to unpack the common salvation, the, the, you know, how it was delivered to the saints and talk about what all those things mean. But 
I found it necessary to talk about something else. And this something else is, I think, what makes Jude so interesting. And in verse four, he this is where he kind of takes the turn, if you will, and says, this, I, I was going to do that, but I'm feeling compelled to do this. And so that kind of picks up at verse four. And this is our um, teaser. Yeah, because I think the whole rest of the letter after yeah. four unpacks what you need to know about and what he's getting ready to talk about. It's no coincidence we're going to stop on verse four and kind of tease right. you a little bit. Um, That's go, right. ahead. go ahead. Yeah, well, we just want to tee it up. We want to give some context to why are we even looking at Jude to begin with? Like, what are we trying to accomplish out of this study? And so I, my prayer is that this first episode unpacks some a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of broma in three verses. That's how beautiful the living word is. You know, the reason that we can unpack stuff at this level, uh, not just Mike and I, we as in Christians, the faith, the body, we can do this because it's living and God will work in and through it and teach you things in life and through other people. And, uh, and you can read the same verse a hundred times and sometimes get something new every time. So this, we're just, man, this, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, but if we yeah, do, then, if we do another Jude study in six months, we'll have totally separate notes, but yes. probably, <laughs> yeah, probably. Although in fairness, we actually have done a, a Jude study before. And although the notes are, are different for sure, they follow very, sure. there's still a lot of core stuff there that we Absolutely. talked about the fir- first go around. Um, so yeah, man, if you don't mind, if you could reverse four, when he starts to kind of take this turn and he's pivoting, pivoting his attention to a whole nother, <laughs> uh, deep discussion, and uh, yeah, man. Um, so verse four for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. What do you got for it? Oh, uh, man, a lot. There's so much there. Um, but the first thing I want to point out is so he was going to talk about all these other things. And now he says, but I want to talk about this thing. And, and the urgency there um, is there's these false teachers or false teachings that have kind of crept into the church. And he wants Jews were trying to address that, th- these false teachings. And so then he starts to kind of unpack who these people are, who are these certain people that have kind of crept in. And uh, they're, here's what we can know about them. One, they're designated for condemnation. The Greek word there is, uh, I might mess this up, but I believe it's prografo. Um, in the Greek literature, um, it literally, when, when, you, when you read it in other pieces of literature, it, that same word's used to describe like official decrees or like contracts, deeds of sale, public notice, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's like written beforehand. Um, so these false teachers that have crept in that Jude wants to talk about, they're predestined for condemnation, if you will. They're already damned. The decision's already been made. That's pretty heavy stuff. So th- this is this is something to pay attention to. No wonder there was an urgency to say, I wanted to talk about all that awesome common salvation stuff. But there's some people have crept in. This is a big problem. Um, here's another thing we can know about these people. They're ungodly. They're just in its simplest form, like they're anything that's not God. And ungodly can even look like you making yourself God. Anything that doesn't come from the most high, anything that doesn't put something, doesn't put God first in every decision it makes, um, ungodly. All right, that tells us something about what these false teachings might look like. Well, they might be ungodly. So I think it's important to define ungodly. I would argue it's disobedience. Um, and then, and here's why I say that, because the other thing is that we we can pick up here is they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. And we talked about this before with the sauce, like the, the perverting just simply means to change something to another thing, to alter its very nature. And this is why I do think this whole idea of like ingredients to the doctrine, ingredients to the gospel, understanding true ingredients uh, matters. It's a faith matter. Biblical food. Yeah. Biblical food. And it, and it's going to fit that framework, understanding that you know, all of that, the full counsel of God um, will help you be able to identify these false teachers and false teachings. You follow what I'm saying? Um, so what did they do? What are some of the things they're teaching? Well, 
they're they're altering the grace into like a sexual thing. And so what that meant is like it was saying because of grace, because of the cross, because of mercy, because of the gospel, the part of the good news of the gospel is that your sins have been paid for. That is indeed true if you are of the faith. These teachers were saying because of that, it's already paid for, you're good. You can pursue sexual things. You have a license to sexual perversion. And so we got to pause there. That's, do we see any occultic behavior like that where they like behave where they're trying to, I don't know, do a ritual to their God and they do sexual type of things to, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, man, false teachers, they've crept in, they've been predestined. These are evil systems. Um, This is the enemy at work. These are old spirits at work. Mm. Some might say Nephilim. You're doing a lot, Some, of, a lot of teasing there, brother. Dude, <laughs> there, there, there's something at work behind this perversion of the grace that seems to include. You see where I'm going with this. So there's a. We're going to find out, I think, in Jude, what are the spirits at work? How can we protect ourselves, protect our families, have proper doctrine, good understanding, a way to combat, uh, beat back evil darkness in this present age. I believe that Jude unpacks that. Um, and that's why this one chapter book in part is so fascinating. That's yeah. all I got. Yeah, man. Um, that was awesome. Great teasing. Uh, I'm not the best storyteller. I probably won't leave you with a cliffhanger, but um, <laughs> what I noticed here for, so for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. So that should be like a, like a wake up call. Like there's people that have crept in or, or entities that have crept in unnoticed. So always be on alert, be a watchman. Um, it's ever been, everything's not coffee and donuts. Um, those who were long beforehand marked out. So when I saw that word marked out, I'm thinking of the Revelation verse where you're blotted out of the book of life. Your name was already there. You just have to receive the invitation. I went through the wedding feast in Matthew 22. You were marked out. You didn't come to the wedding. Um, these individuals were marked out for condemnation. Ungodly, Dan did a great job of that, turning in the grace, um, denying our only master. Um and that word kind of linked me back to Second Peter. We talked about that in the intro. Second um, Peter 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you. So these certain persons have crept in unnoticed. False prophets. What did a prophet do? False teachers. What do they do? What makes someone false? Um, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. So they're not doing it out in the open, guys. This thing, this ain't going to be devils in red horns here, with red suit on and fire. Okay, these are these are secrets. They, they're 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 it's not your your they, normal. They they crept in. They didn't they crept in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they tried to be like one of us, like wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, and then Second Peter continues, even denying the Master who bought them. So it's the same thing as Jude denying the Master. So and it's also saying bought. Where do we get from that? He bought us for a price, right? So it's it's not only the spirit entities that Dan was talking about. It's talking about believers, like not believers, but people who claim, you know, Christ, but they end up denying him. They bring swift destruction upon them. Many, many will follow their sensuality. What does that mean? I didn't look into the Greek word, but they're going to follow that sensuality. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed... They will exploit you. I can think of a few instances today. Their greed will exploit you with their false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle. So again, I just want to focus on false prophets, false teaching. Secretly, they crept mm-hmm. in unnoticed. Mm-hmm. Um, don't follow their sensuality. They're doing it for greedy reasons to exploit you with their false words and judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there was a reason, you know, Dan went and I went back and forth on when we should stop this episode. I think we ended up in a perfect spot. One through four, it, you know, we did a great job explaining the good news and one through three, but now we're kind of teasing you with this verse four. Um, 
And what do you got there for brother? Anything? Yeah. Add? So yeah, there's a, there's so much there to unpack too. There's a lot left in, in episode two. Uh, I think we plan to leave a little bit of the fluff out in the beginning, uh, maybe try to recap on where we left off, but then pick yeah. up. And the book ends with a, a great doxology. Um, and so it's just a little bit of a spoiler alert there. It ends with pointing to the, the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. So that's the spoiler alert. Um, but man, there's so much to, to learn in that journey. Mm -hmm. And so I look forward to going through it, um, you know, when we can, I think the aim is hopefully next Friday, but listen, life happens. Yep. We've got full-time jobs, families, yep. a lot of other responsibilities, but That's our goal. you know, God willing, and he, you know, carves out that time. Then that our goal is to do episode two then. Yep. And this was awesome, man. And yeah, before we, we end off here, so please like share and subscribe. We, we want you to continue to hear us. Um, Add your questions. We we just want to humbly serve the, the most high in Yeshua and just tackle these topics. We want to do topical studies and also book studies. Um yeah. Dan, you wanna should we just pray out here? That'd be great. Yeah. So like Mike said, don't rely on us just to send you text messages and stuff yeah. letting you know there's a podcast. <laughs> we love you. We appreciate your, your support. But like, you know, give us give us honest progressive feedback. Absolutely. Like, let us know what you think. Uh, and if you have any major objections to what we're saying, please, 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 brother or sister, approach us and let us know what that is. So, yep. Father, we come before you thankful. We're humble. Father, we can approach you because of the finished work of your son, that we have already received mercy and peace and love. And Father, we know those things to be true. Would you just change in our hearts the ability and the want and the desire and the, and the, and the need uh, to draw closer to you through obedience, through prayer, through worship. Father, would you just continue to do a work in Mike's life? I pray over his marriage. I ask, Father, that you'd put the right people in his lives, that you would give him eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart that is like yours. Father, would you just receive what we're doing here as worship? I pray that if anybody's been impacted, that it would be your Holy Spirit that begins and starts to do and till up a work change father god would you ask would you would you just move us in a direction that looks more like you more fully glorified i pray for protection over our families and it's in the mighty strong name of jesus we pray amen, amen. and i just want to say everybody has gifts dan has a gift with words and that was just beautiful um we hope you enjoyed the first part of jude this is bromology the study of biblical food shalom